You're listening to China Manufacturing Decoded from the Sophie's Group. Hi, welcome back to the podcast. It's episode 228. Today, we've just entered August, so summer's still hanging in there, Paul. Paul Adams is with me. I'm Adrian, and Paul's our head of new product development and a very experienced engineer. And we need him on board for this episode because we're talking about product design, optimizations, and best practices. So basically, under the big umbrella of product design and development, Paul's going to be going into three important aspects that you need to be thinking about when you are developing your product in order to optimize that design and make some quite telling improvements. And Paul's going to take us through those. Paul, hello. Hello, Adrian. Good to be back. And thanks for the intro. Uh, very good. I'm excited about this episode, actually, because this, uh, you know, this is an area that I've been uh, sort of looking into and uh, living my life for the past 30 plus years, Yes, which is all about product design and development. That's it. And when we talk about product design development, I mean, wow, you know, we could probably cover this in unlimited episodes of the podcast, 12, 14, <laughs> 24 hours worth of talking. So to sort of condense it into 40 odd minutes, we're not going to cover every single thing. And you have highlighted three aspects to cover today, right? Yeah, the three things that uh, I think, as you say, to keep it keep it down and, and sensible for for uh, sort of the listeners to actually digest and understand. We're going to break it down into three particular areas. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one being the optimizing design for cost, size, and weight. So I should be touching on some of those aspects. The second one I want to talk about because most of the products we uh, sort of involved with around the world today is uh, electromechanical. So the electrical part is. PCB design optimization with mm. respect to design and a layout. Yes. And the last one is, is a very clearly an obvious one that really is key and has product functionality and reliability. We need to make sure that we're designing for all of those aspects. Yes, yeah. Okay, so that that's the three that we're focusing on. So without further ado, that, let's just jump straight in then to the topic number one. And as you mentioned, that's how to optimize your design for cost, size, and weight. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I'm going to break that down into the three obvious ones, to subsections. Um, so let's uh, focus on cost to start with. Hmm. Um, now, there are a number of different strategies that you look at, but ultimately what you want to be doing is not over-engineering. Okay, so as soon as you start to over-engineer things, the cost of the product goes up tremendously, exponentially. Uh, even um, and, and it's really you need to look at some of the smart strategies with respect to components, material, and standard items. Uh, I want to talk about standard items. I've got one product we're developing at the moment, for example. It, it's got a lot of piping for water um, mm -hmm. and, and liquids going through it. So instead of designing joints and connections and stuff like this, we need to start looking at um, products that are already certified and which will come into that again, uh, reliability wise. But there's no point in reinventing the wheel because once you start doing that, that starts to add cost, not from just a component point of view, but also from a tooling aspect and, and a time point of view, instead of just identifying a standard component that has already been tested and proven it's been in the marketplace for a long time it's already got the reliability figures behind it start to use those aspects so a lot of that is really about looking at your component selection um, and looking at readily available components also looking at the different materials you know, there's a lot of components out there a lot of, lot of products that are screwed together now if you're going to start to have 10 20 different screw types and nuts and bolts and stuff like this that's again you're looking at inventory levels you're looking at uh the management systems to look after all of that the purchasing power goes down uh the the, the part count goes up if you start to look at optimizing one type or minimal types of uh, changes from a screw aspect for example that's going to bring your cost down Okay, so basically we're looking at all of these different 
strategies with respect to bringing the cost down? It, it kind of makes me feel like uh, it, it sound like IKEA because IKEA keep everything streamlined and you don't get a whole huge bag of parts. You have a relatively small number of different t- different types of fasteners, components, things like that. Well, it's for a reason, you know, and it's exactly what we're t- talking about. Yeah, you know, they, they're in the game of uh, sort of making life easy for for the end user. Um, now, it's, if if my uh, if my poor old dad, if he was still around, and he bought one of these uh, desks, you know, he wouldn't want to hunt around for which screw length goes where. You know, I've got the same size screws. It doesn't matter. Just pick one up and and throw it in, and uh, he'll be able to build this desk. That's mm. not a problem. So, yeah. You know, it's, it's it's making life easy for the end user in that particular instance. But at the end of the day, IKEA have been smart because they've used a strategy mm-hmm. with respect to keeping the art cost down because they've used a single size common product in their uh, assembly. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. So another area when, when it comes to, you know, cost versus quality is is materials. There's one of those things that we need to uh, consider as engineers. It's it's all very well, you know, looking at some of the metals that are around, uh, some of the exotic uh, materials that we've got available to us today from a polymer selection. And you think, if I, you, know, blimey, you know, the new iPhone is like titanium. You know, if I could make my product that titanium, that would be awesome. However, let's look at the cost of that versus something that is just as good for the product that is being um, sort of designed. Now, when we're looking at this, we always need to go back to basics with respect to what is the function of the product that you are designing. For a phone, okay, iPhones are a little bit different to some of the sort of lower lower entry cost phones from a material aspect, but that's because they want to differentiate themselves. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. Okay, but from a functional point of view, it's still a phone. Okay, so you can um, get uh, sort of very low cost, low entry level phones that are not titanium, for example, and they work just as well from a phone point of view. Mm. Okay, so again, we need to come back to the functionality. Of what is the product designed to do? What is what is the the output from that product? And therefore, you need to start to optimize from a material point of view. And if you can look at the Optimum material versus cost, and that's what you should be doing, as opposed to, you know, designing for the nice exotic materials just because they're available. Mm. Okay, so that, that, that's a really important factor when it comes to that. So, yeah, it's, it's very much a design versus cost versus quality, reliability, balance uh, that the, the engineers need to have a look at when they're designing products like this. So it's not always a case of cost wins, because then if you're using the, uh, the the lowest cost option to you, that may not meet the requirements for the product either. So again, we've got this fine balance with respect to understanding mm-hmm. what the product function is all about, and making yep. sure that you engineer to meet those specifications and requirements. Uh, so that's mm. that's, a, that's a really important factor uh, when it comes to material choice, for example. And, th- and another thing that uh, I think you and I spoke about previously, Adrian, is is all about design strategies. But mm. uh, there are a number of different design strategies when it comes to um, best practices. Uh, let me let me let me stick with plastics, it's an area that uh, I know quite a bit about, and over the past few years involved in. There are a number of different best practices that you need to follow in order to get your plastic part out of a tool. Now, if you again, if you over-engineer something, yeah, your tool maker you know, is going to be happy enough to take your money and build the tool and produce you an over-engineered product um, day in, day out. But uh, as an engineer, you really should be smart with respect to optimizing the design, reducing some of the material, but keeping in the uh, the strength or rigidity or whatever the um, sort of functionality and the specification requirements deem, mm. then that's what you should be doing. However, again, this it's all about best practices from a design point of view will make sure that you've got a best cost-optimized product design. Yeah, absolutely. Sense? 
<laughs> I know, it, and then there's a lot of a uh, lot of backs and forwards in there, but you know, it it is a balance. It's not just you know design the cost. You know, no, you can't do that. You know, you've got to look at it's the overall package. Basically. Well, it, you don't want to be in a race to the bottom because ultimately that's probably going to result in a product that's not got good quality or reliability. Of course, if your product doesn't need to have good quality or reliability, sure, but most products probably do. Indeed, indeed, yes. Yeah, uh, well, so you, you're saying that. I think we've all been out there and purchased something. Cool, I've got a price of that. I'm going to get it, and it's lasted a week or so. You think? Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, and that's and that's exactly it, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Exactly. Uh, shall we shall we move on to talking about right. size and weight? Yes, right. Let's let's look at the size now. Again, this is all about what the product is designed to do. You know that there's always room for uh, maneuvering on the the design with respect to size. But if you if you're in a product uh, design loop where you're looking at optimizing for yeah, we've already talked about cost. If you're making a smaller product, then that could actually bring the cost down as well. And again, there's different techniques in order to bring the footprint of the product its size down itself. Um, and that, you know, if you look at the PCB, for example, uh, but I'm going to touch on PCBs later on uh, a little bit more in depth. You yeah. know, but there's there's ways that you can actually bring the size of the PCB down. Therefore, the housing around it can be smaller and therefore that generally the, the whole product can be reduced in size. Um, so that's one element you know, we can certainly look at from that aspect, uh, which is good. And again, it's like sometimes like, bigger is better, um, mm -hmm. depending on what, so what we're looking at. Uh, and everything needs to come back to the functionality of the design of the product itself. Um, but when it comes to size reduction, you know, it's, again, you're looking at standard components. You're looking at um, different techniques with respect to joining two parts together and making a single part. Um, now that, again, that covers cost as well as weight. Um, so, again, everything we're looking at here is not just a singular uh, descriptive um, way of doing something or designing, the whole thing comes as a holistic methodology uh, yeah. of best practices. You know, so sizing can be a very difficult thing because it's all down to uh, fit, form, and function. However, you know, there are some size constraints when it comes to cost. You know, if you need to go smaller, more often than not, you need to go more expensive. Mm. You know, so again, this is trade-off with respect to what you need in your design. You know, some of those miniaturization packages on the on the electronics, um, they do cost a little bit more. Um, so therefore, your cost is going to go up. However, your overall part size is going to come down. And again, we've got this fine balance with respect to where we're going. Um, but when it comes to weight, again, you know, it's th these three are, are highly interlinked. Uh, with respect to uh, sort of, you can't trade one off without the other, as it were. Um, so if we're going smaller, generally we're going lighter, mm. but we could go more expensive. You know, so you can't have one without the other, as it were. But when it comes to weight, let me uh, let me focus on that. For example, you know, some of the weight areas that we can look at from a design aspect. You know, we can look at different materials. You know, I mentioned earlier from a cost aspect, if we're looking at titanium. All right, let's let's look at an alternative to metal. Let's go plastic. What are some of the uh, engineering polymers that are available to us today with all of these fillers and additives that make these polymers extremely strong, tough, and hard, just as good as some of the materials out there from a, a metal point of view? Mm -hmm. um, so that's certainly one way to reduce the weight. Uh, when we're looking at designing a product, look at, making it more of a hollow section, more of a honeycomb section uh, instead of a, a solid block of material, whether that be metal or plastic. You're still going to get the strength. You're still going to get the rigidity and uh, uh, the structural integrity with uh, something that's designed like that. Um, so that's always a good aspect. However, the weight will be dramatically reduced. Um, so that's another area. Again, it's just looking at best practices. Uh, if we're looking at injection molded parts, we don't want to be injection injection molding 
big solid areas because that's going to cause a lot of problems from a surface defect point of view hollow marks sink marks um the the polymer um is it's not going to be uh crystallized in uh in the center as well as what it should be for example so there's a lot of problems when it comes to big blocky materials when we're when we're molding um so what we need to look at uh, reducing the weight, reducing the material used on that. And again, that goes hand in hand with cost reduction, you know, because mm. we're using less material. And uh, from a size point of view, well, you know, the size is the size when it comes to that. But, it, you know, it's all of these, again, reiterate that all three of these are very, very closely interlinked. Um, yeah. So, which is. And, and, and it can so, be a, like, you know, weight reduction can be a force for good but it could also be a negative thing for example i know um we've talked about if shady suppliers try to start uh cutting the amount of material they're using to save a bit of money make a bit more margin but they're not telling you their customer so you end up with uh maybe of the product that you're expecting the walls are too thin which will make it structurally unsound or something like that you know so Correct. that's that's a, that's one of the negatives so you got to watch out for that Yes, that's right. And, and and I'm just going to touch on another point here, which, again, we're going to talk about later on, is, is, is the importance of finding that right balance between the weight and the functionality. You know, yeah, A lightweight product may be, bizarre, may be desirable, as you just mentioned, you know, with, uh, you know, with different performances and stuff like this. However, you know, you, what you don't want to be doing is sacrificing durability and the performance of the product itself because yeah. of that. Again, a fine balance, but uh, from an engineering aspect, you know, a lot of tools out there, which I'm not going to go into, that allow us to run simulations and look at stress and uh, and everything like this from a, a CAD aspect point of view, um, which really should be doing. Again, that's another another topic that we can talk about another day. <laughs> yeah, we'll put it on the list. Yes. Indeed. Okay, great. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was three common optimizations not all of the optimizations that you might uh, make to your design but probably three that that a lot of people will be thinking about you mentioned earlier just briefly you touched on pcbs we're going to go into that now but in a bit more detail so let's say we are creating an electromechanical product it's probably going to have a pcb of some description in it that's essentially kind of like the brain of the operation right so what are the best practices for uh the pcb design and the layout well as you mentioned to start with we could talk 20 30 40 hours on this particular <laughs> subject and, and this is this is one of the areas that uh you know i need, I need to rein myself back in from a from a descriptive point of view and going on and on and on. Yeah, I'm watching How, the clock. Don't worry. I should I should try and summarize the best we can when it comes to this. So let me start with some of the best practices. You know that we Ooh. we work with in house at uh, where we are, uh, Jillian and that. Yeah, yeah. So let's put um, signal integrity. You know, it's it's one of those things where you know we we see often. Uh, so we, we've got a problem with the signal or something like this. So minimizing the trace length and maintaining consistent impedance is really important when it comes to track and track lengths. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that will, that'll, well, if we get that right, the shorter the trace reduces the signal distortion. Okay. The longer the trace, the more problematic the signal becomes over that period, um, over, the, over the length of the track itself. Um, so that's the first point. Um, second point on signal integrity is um, you need to in, uh, employ differential signals for high-speed data transmission. High-speed data transmission these days is a fairly common thing. However, this, um, this reduces the noise and improves the signal quality. So we need to look at differential signal signaling. Okay. Um, and one of the biggest ones we look at, uh, we try and optimize the ground plane. You know, as the bigger the ground plane, the better. Um, generally, um, so we need to have a look at that. Uh, make sure that is maximized and optimized where we can. Uh, and again, this I can put, point my finger to several PCB designs that we've got on uh, on the table at the moment where we've had to do this, and and it has made a difference. Okay, mm -hmm. so let's switch down to power. Um, now this goes hand in hand with the signal. What we don't want to be doing is uh, 
crossing lines or making the lines too close when it comes to signal or data transmission and power transmission. Um, so we need to make sure that is okay. So making sure that the uh, wide power planes are are as optimized the best uh, the best we can. In other words, making the tracks as wide as possible to carry the, uh, the required current. Uh, so that's all good. And we need to um, look at the different voltage levels. Uh, sometimes we need to go to multi-level, uh, multi-plane uh, sort of PT PCBs in order to break that out. So that's one thing. We could go on and on and on. This. So I'm just going to rattle through some of these, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thermal, the thermal management as well. We need to make sure that we're looking after our heat dissipation correctly. Uh, we've got a lot of components on a PCB, and some of those get hot. Some of those get too hot in certain areas and interfere with other components that are placed on the PCB adjacent or close to it. Uh, so we need to look at that. And that's an important aspect. So we need to make sure that we're not overheating or we, we make sure that we are preventing overheating of uh, some of the components. So what what, um, what are some of the things that what are some of the things that we might do to to, to manage the heat? Well, there's a couple of things you can do if you've got space on the PCB. You can obviously put a heat sink, uh, which is just an aluminium sort of bed uh, yeah. that's the, uh, that the component is placed upon that would dissipate the, the heat more nicely. Um, mm. Some of these are quite large. Some of these heat dissipation uh, sort of, um, beds are quite large, and they've got fins on them, so therefore they radiate the heat nicely and manage the heat um, and dissipate the heat like that, uh, which is good. If it's a smaller component, um, sorry, SMT product, uh, that can be placed in a certain area where it doesn't interfere from uh, uh, the heat heating up sensitive, other sensitive components. Um, so it's really isolating those particular components that you know could get a little bit hot, you know, when we're talking about small components, SMT components, they don't really get super, super hot. Um, but on some of the bigger PCBs, we may have components that do get considerably hotter than the, the you would expect. Um, so mm. they need to be managed very, very carefully. Um, and heat sink is generally the, the best way to do that. Yeah. Another way to do it is, is if it's uh, only just a simple uh, component that goes down, we can just put some, some heat paste um, on there. It's, it's same thing as the uh, uh, the heat sink, but just in a paste format, and that'll uh, sort of manage some of the heat uh, from the component itself. Um, so that's all good. And another thing is you can actually transfer the heat from the top to the bottom via uh, through wires. You know, the wire is uh, for those in the know that will know. For those in the don't know, there's a basically the hole through the the PCB uh, which connected. Um, via the other planes, and we basically just uh, sort of direct the heat from one area to another, uh, from the top to the bottom. Uh, so that that tends to work quite nicely as well mm. in some areas. It, another big one is uh, is all about component placement. It's making sure that you're putting com right components in the right area. In other words, you you, you all your signals um, and all your data components are linked together or, or grouped together. All of your um, power distribution components are, are separated out um, from your your data signals. If you start to mix those up in you know a random format, you're going to get all sorts of problems with your data. Uh, your data is not going to be clean. It's going to get corrupted and stuff like this. So again, just the best practices, just common sense, really. Yeah, you know, just grouping these things together. So that Ooh. that's all good. And that comes really down to the next part, which is layout techniques. Once you've got your schematic, once you've got your, okay, this is what needs to happen. These are the signals, these are the components, then you need to lay it out. Um, so these layout um, needs to be correct with respect to what we just talked about, putting the components in the right place, in the right order, separating out um, sensitive components from your data and your uh, and your power lines and stuff like this. So it really comes down to um, sort of layout techniques. And again, there's a lot of software out there that will allow you to do that and help you manage and check the work that you're doing when it comes to layout optimization, um, So, which is very useful. And, and again, it's, it's really down to best practices. And one of the best practices that we certainly follow is peer reviews. So, you know, if you're designing something yourself, it's very easy for you to self-check and go, yeah, everything's good, it's looking good, come on. 
we've, we've done a good job here. Let's go straight to uh, the next stage, prototype this thing, and, oh, it, it, it doesn't work. Something's wrong. And you, know, you spend ages and ages and ages trying to find the fault and debugging and stuff like this. With a simple peer review, you know, getting someone else to review your work, you know, this is not a um, backwards view. You know, this is really, it's not a case of like, uh you know, can you check my work? Because I'm not sure. No, no, it's just best practice with respect to this is what the process should be. Um, so getting someone else to look at your work is always best. You know, it's getting a proofreader, writing, you know, um, you know when you've written, um, written something, uh, an article, it's always good to have a proofreader before you publish that. Sure. Um, so that the same thing here. Same thing here. So again, it's all about best practices and making sure you follow those um, throughout. And I suppose that's, this is why we're, that... we're creating prototypes with like breadboards and stuff like that. So you can quickly mess around with the PCB placement of different components and things like that, right? Correct. Yes, that's right. That's, that's, that's the very uh, sort of basics of uh, starting a design from a, mm. a PCB point of view is breadboarding it out. Um, that's a very, very easy way to do it. Uh, make sure that everything's functioning. Make sure the LEDs come on. Make sure the timer starts. Make sure the timer stops. Uh, etc make sure the motor starts when it should and stops when it should etc yeah. yeah. and that's uh, definitely the the best way to start something that's like that mm -hmm. for sure okay so um i think last on the list for pcb then you're going to talk about dfm yeah design for manufacture that's that's an obvious one uh, and again i want to come back to a sort of particular product we has uh just talking about today um actually is we were manufacturing this is a flexible PCB, really nice product, really nice product. However, uh, the the, uh, sort of the the substrate that we were using, or the flex uh, we were using, was a little bit too thin, and we couldn't actually work out what the problem was until we actually went up at uh, it was a point one of a millimeter, mm. and, and that resolved the particular. I won't go into the problem, but uh, the particular problem we had, as well as. You know, making this thing, you know, the product uh, a little bit more reliable. So, you know, desire for manufacturer is a thing. It, it really is a thing. And we need to make sure that we're, again, a standard checklist, making sure that everything's okay. And and some of the things on we're looking at here is component placement, uh, making sure that we're following the standard rules and regulations when it comes to uh, sort of PCB placement. Now, in general, what I'm talking about here is SMT products you know, a surface mount technology design PCBs, uh, which is generally, yeah, 90% of the things that we see, if not more, uh, mm. comes through the door. Now, with the SMT, obviously, the, the uh, sort of design there is optimized for high-speed placement of smaller components, making the, making the board itself more efficient. Again, going back to the very first point we were talking about is cost, you know, this brings the cost down of the overall product itself. Why? Because we've got standard components on there. We've got the product, which is a little bit smaller, allowing the, the footprint to be, you know, reduced in size. Um, so that's that. Um, but we also need to, again, something I just mentioned is the PCB thickness and the material that you're using as well. You know, generally we're using FR4 as a, as a, as a board material. Um, but these days, you know, we, we, we're using a lot of flexible PCB materials in some of the products we're developing. And that's, uh, that's an interesting thing. One of the, one of the things that I want to highlight that again, it came around that caused us issues. We couldn't actually understand what the issue was, was, um, and, and it was all about the copper used on the flexible PCB itself. Now, there's two ways. There's rolled copper and there's etched copper. Okay, we had the standard etched copper, and as it was being flexed, it was it was fracturing, and some of the uh, the tracks were were not as reliable, and that was causing us problems. And we couldn't work out what the problem is. We removed place and replaced components um, away from this particular area. And oh, come on, guys, this is a flex piece speed. This is what it should be doing. But it was all down to the type of copper being used on the flex PCB. Uh, and we had to go to the rolled copper or RA copper, solve the problem. Now, again, this comes down to desire for manufacturability. You know, is the product 
manufacturable. And, and this is what we need to look at. Um, so we're looking at all aspects and material thickness. I mentioned that earlier. We had to increase from 0.3 to 0.4, or was it 0.2 to 0.3, whatever the case be. It was just a 0.1 increase. Solved the problem on the other um, particular flex PCB we were looking at. But again, we need to be looking at the effects of the signal integrity, the mechanical strength, the fit within the product itself, uh, and making sure that everything can be um, produced not just from a single component point of view, but from the overall assembly aspect. Okay, mm. and this is where the design for manufacturability comes into play when we're talking about uh, PCBs. Um, and again, I'll go back to the uh, original statement I made on some of the other things earlier, which standardization. Let's look at standard components. And when we're looking at components, making sure that we are choosing components from a reliable supplier, making sure those components are not end of life, making sure that the components have been tested and verified in, in a certain way um, that fits your requirements for the product. So mm -hmm. again, we're not with a standard checklist with respect to common practices and design for manufacturability. You need to make sure that you're covering that aspect as well, even when it comes to PCBs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's PCBs. I know we've uh, gone through that relatively quickly, and that could be an episode in itself. But because they are yeah. such an important component, it's worth devoting a bit of time to them in, in the um, frame of product design optimization. So that's PCBs covered. Great. So on to the third and final part now, please, Paul. And that is ensuring product functionality and reliability. And I mean, these are going to be key top of mind points for a lot of people who are developing their new product, right? Well, it is, you know, So, and, and everything we're talking about today so far is it is all comes down to this really is, is really making sure that you're designing a product that lasts for the requirement of the product life cycle. Yeah, it's no yep. point in putting out a super cheap product that we talked about earlier, you know, last a week, you know, that, that's not going to achieve anything um, uh, apart from, you know, the, the negative reviews and yeah, annoying uh, people. customers. Yes, that's yeah. right. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, so you've got to optimize the cost. Uh, you need to optimize the size. You need to optimize the weight. And why? Because you need to make sure you're building and designing a reliable product. Um, you need to make sure that it's functional, fully functional, um, and that we are, all of these functions are reliable every single time they it's operated or whatever the product is. Mm. Um, so, you know, we, I know that you, you've talked about this um, or we've had a podcast on this subject in the past, I think. Um, oh, almost Andrew, certainly. Andrew, yeah, I think Andrew came on and talked about design for reliability. Yeah, yeah, um, more than once, I think. Yes, that's right. So, and again, I'm going to bring it up now. Yeah, because mm. it's an important, it's an important factor. Well, when we're talking about functionality and reliability, mm -hmm. now, we need to uh, sort of look at um, DFR, design for reliability, which involves designing a you know product to function consistently. I will minimal failures over an expected lifespan. Yeah, which is exactly what I said. Um, so how do you do that? Well, yeah, you take in all of the consideration we've just spoken about. Yeah, you know, and we need to look at component selection. Let me focus on that for again, again. Um, but as as a general overall holistic statement, yeah, you know, we need to be looking at choosing high quality components. And these components, they really need to be. Um, tried and tested and approved, and they need to last with the. Uh, when I'm talking about last, they need to make sure that they can last the life cycle of the product itself in whatever condition the product should go out in. You know, I've done some work previously on a on an article with respect to material selection on outdoor plastics. You know, and one of yes. the things that I looked at there was an, um, an LED sign outside a shop, you know, or over in the Philippines, you know, so we get a lot of um, uh, typhoons or over here in Asia, you know, a lot of typhoons and big storms coming in 
and the plastic needs to you know make sure that it's up there in 5 10 15 20 years of life you know so it's not just you know looking at you know the elements of a pcb making sure they are consistent mm. and and uh, reliable it's the overall product selection and material selection to make sure everything's going to last a lifetime okay so that's component selection another area to look at when we're looking at component selection is the the environment that's in the temperature you know it's like over here in asia we can look at you know, fairly hot mm. temperatures you know but what if you're in alaska you know you look at a very cold temperatures and it could be for exactly the same product you know that product may be used in you know both extreme areas of the world or extreme conditions of whatever that condition may be in, uh, which really takes you on to the environmental conditions uh, and considerations. You know, so when we're looking at temperature, you know, we're looking at temperature shock. You know, it could be very hot during the day, but at night time, you know, minus 20 degrees, whatever. You know, is the product going to last or, you know, be able to withstand those extreme temperature changes every day for the next 10 years? Uh, this is something you need to really consider when you're looking at <clears throat> functionality and reliability from a design aspect. Yeah. Um, so that you know, another thing that we look at in in uh, in our testing is vibration. Well, and uh, two things when it comes to vibration, um, two things comes to mind is product use itself. You know, in daily use, you know, what vibration is the product going to be susceptible to? And therefore, all of the components need to withstand that same vibration. Mm. Um, if it's uh, in, in an environment where uh, it's a sports product we're developing, for example, and it's going to be used in, uh, in a soccer match or a football match or a rugby match or someone's running or something like this, it's going to be consistently being moved around, jogged around, um, shocked and stuff like this, um, and, and and that's going to be very different to to other products that are going to be used in the house. So that's the first type of vibration I'm thinking about. The second type of vibration I'm thinking about is the low vibration during transit. So we've packed the product; it goes out in a nice little box, big box sometimes. You know, it gets put on the back of a lorry. That lorry then gets loaded into a container. The container gets put on a ship. You know, it gets unpacked, and you know, you got the last mile with the DHL guy thrown out over the fence at your, at your door. <laughs> can, can the you know, we've seen the videos? Let's face it. We are feeling. Uh, so you know, so can the product withstand that type of vibration as well? So again, it's looking at all of these environmental con you know, conditions that you need to start to design into the product itself right from the scratch. Mm. Um, a lot of people miss that point. A lot of people miss that when they're designing a product. Um, another area I want to go back to, which uh, takes me back years, is uh, stress testing. Um, mm. Again, you know, we're we're lucky enough to to have some equipment in uh, in our test lab that allows us to look at this. Um, but when we're looking at stress testing, we could actually put that into various different categories of stress testing. Now, the original one I'm thinking about is the material can be stress tested. In other words, pulled apart and see what that stress within that material can withstand. Ooh. Well, yeah, that's one thing, but that one it really comes down to material selection back at the beginning of the design aspects. But Stress testing, that really comes into what we'll be just talking about, the environment um, conditions or the you know, the shock and the vibration environment. We can actually look at that. You need to start designing your product with respect to real-world scenarios yeah. and push it beyond the expected use window. Yeah? So in other words, you're stressing it past the expected use level. Okay, this is basically what we're talking about, stress testing from a product reliability point of view. And again, this is an area where a lot of people design just to make it work. What we need to be doing is putting in a level factor of uh, safety and making sure that we're actually designing over and above what the expected limit is such that it can withstand these stress levels um, so yeah. from time. And that could that could be anything. You know, it could be um, force, push, you know, stretch, crush, 
um, temperature, wind, voltage. Don't forget the voltage aspects of Ooh. things, you know, voltage, under voltage. You know, is it still going to work? Um, all of these things need to be considered whilst we're designing that from a reliability point of view. Um, so which is a really, really big thing to, to look at. And it's, it's not always an easy thing to do because the design stage, when you're at the CAD, you always got to think about the end use in 10 years time, um, which is obviously a, a, a long way away from, you know, you pushing your mouse around on the CAD to make sure that you get it in the right and optimized design. But it's a really important factor to take in consideration. Mm, yeah. And it's really going to de de depend so much on the different types of products that are being made. It's not one size fits all. Oh, absolutely. I don't think any two components are the like, you know, when it yeah. comes to, you know, you've got one screw, it's going to go, okay, it's going to go into a automotive um, product versus uh, you know, something around the office, you know, totally yeah. different use. So, you know, exactly the same screw. So, you know, it is very much a case of uh, looking at this from a holistic point of view, making sure that you're, you're trying to tick all of the boxes as you go down. It's almost like a checklist, you know, when you're doing this design and development and making sure that you're looking at optimizing, you know, let, let me go right back to the beginning, looking at the cost, you know, making sure that you can actually hit those costs from a product point of view, making sure that you can optimize your product to, you know, meet the functionality as well as, everything that we just spoken about today mm. yeah. not an easy thing you know and, and it takes uh takes some skill and design but you know once you've got that um it, it's really good to have a, a checklist uh we've got a number of uh checklists that we work with uh, we've got um some like i said peer reviews that we go through standard practices best practices um this is the best thing to do and follow all the time it really mm. is mm. Yeah, so I think the 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 practices that you're talking about, these are some of the key ones that should be integrated into product design and development. But if you're not so familiar with doing this, then you're going to be leaning on your supplier. So I suppose a lot of the things that you've been talking about today, this is something to keep in mind when you're discussing with your supplier, who kind of becomes like your partner in this in a way, if 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 they are providing the development expertise and making sure that you are asking them the right questions because if we're not 100 percent clear on our requirements that's where gray areas occur and that's when you end up with a result that you're not happy with right exactly and i don't think there's any anyone out there that's a, a master of all of this yeah you know, so like someone might be yes like, oh, yeah i know about and uh uh, PCBs. I know everything about PCBs, but I know very little about injection molding or the other way around. Yeah, sure. or you know, see, so you've got some castings out there, and and this is where you have to rely on your supplier and your and the relationship you build with the supplier as well. Um, it, that's a, that's a really important aspect. You know, building that relationship, building the trust with your supplier. Um, and and I've always said, you know, the only stupid question is the question that is never asked. Um, so always, always ask questions with respect to areas that you're unsure about or you don't know or you just need clarification. You know, it's, it's not going to be a stupid question, you know, because, you know, always the, if you've got a good relationship with your supplier, that supplier will be happy to help you because, you know, it's going to be a, a really good two way relationship. And that's the key thing there, I think. Mm, great. OK, so those. Those are three important aspects of product design, of optimizing product designs. And you've taken us through some of the best practices. So optimizing the design for cost, size, and weight, making PCBs better in terms of design and layout. So what, what were the best practices for that? And the important for uh, ensuring product functionality and reliability which we just covered and hopefully you're going to be able to apply some of paul's insights into your projects uh, whoever's listening at the moment so thanks paul that's very illuminating loved it and plenty to take away 
you know, we have covered some of these topics in other podcast episodes and some of our content. So check the show notes, guys. I will be adding some links to, you know, for example, when we discussed design for reliability in more detail and things like that. And if I may, I'm going to ask, right, if you're enjoying the podcast and you want to get involved, right, we want to hear what your thoughts are. Do you like the topics we're covering? And are there some topics that you'd like us to cover? Well, you can actually tell us. So we've set up a questionnaire. It's very, very short. And if you go to https colon forward slash forward slash tinyurl.com forward slash cmd podcast. So that's tinyurl.com forward slash cmd podcast, all one word right you can leave your feedback let us know what you're thinking about the podcast and also what topics you would like us to cover that's going to benefit you and we can move forward and make the podcast even more helpful as we carry on through 2024 and go into 2025 so with that said paul thanks for coming on and we'll get you back on again soon uh, it's been a good one Absolutely. I know I rattled through those really, really quickly, but uh, I'm hoping you can take away some, uh, some key points there. And I uh, look forward to talking again soon. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophie's Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com, that's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com, to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share, because it will really help others discover us too.